Okay, welcome. Today I will talk about the, from cradle to grave the life of machine data. When I was invited to the conference to talk, I was really happy. And then they published the timeline, the schedule of the talks. And I saw it was in the same slot like John Romero. And I said, okay, maybe my talk will be hunted. But it's not the case, and I'm really happy about that. Thanks a lot for joining me. Okay, my name is Johannes Moser. I'm product owner at Create.io. Uh, Create.io is building a distributed database called CreateDB. And uh, it's a startup, and it was founded, I think, at the end of 2013. So we are around uh, for some time already. And we have a lot, uh, we work a lot with data. So somehow it feels like we're now in the post big data era. There was a time when big data was a buzzword and everyone was just collecting data. People didn't really knew what they need to, to do with the data. They were just sure at one point they will need it. So they collected and collected and collected. And now I think data has a life cycle. It, cha it changes its anatomy over time and it gets more specific. People know what to collect. So we, are talking, uh, we were talking to one of our customers who's building those switches for, for train rails. And they said, OK, we need to put sensors everywhere. And they tried to sell whole train uh, switches to train companies. And they were not able to because it costs a huge amount of money, money and also to replace it. So they were thinking and thinking. And now they started to put like a, a, a small nail into the already existing infrastructure into an electricity cable. And now they can tell by looking at the values of how much electricity goes through if they need to replace uh, the switch. And so people are getting more and more specific uh, on what they need to collect. So this talk will give basically an overview over how data lives, where it is born, where it dies, if it dies. And I also have added some small demo examples as we are uh, at the VIA Developers Conference. But I, I had uh, this version of the talk incorporates them into the talk as screenshots because internet is always a thing that uh, is a little bit hard at conferences. So why machine data? We have millions of data points per second generated all over the world. It's in production lines, assembly lines. Um, we even have one customer who creates boxes where they, they, they measure um, sensors, and they are able to measure up to 100,000 uh, records per second. And this for uh, up to yeah, many, many sensors. Data is diverse. We have different sensor types. We have different uh, types of data, but still people want to have more and more real-time performance. So they want to do analytics immediately. They are talking about predictive maintenance. People want to know when their machine is stopping because this costs them uh, a shitload of money. So they are looking at this stuff and they want to, uh, to do things like monitoring, alerting, machine learning, to take immediate actions. And this means there's a quite a complex queries of big data volumes. But what, what does machine data now mean? It's basically every data set that is generated by a machine. Let's start the journey at the cradle. So birth, where is data generated? Uh, nowadays, data is generated everywhere, in this room, on our smartphones, uh, but also in, in, in plants uh, and so on. Every second, we generate 
a huge amount of data on this world. We are focusing on, on machine sensors. They use bus systems, which basically, in a, a certain uh, interval, just sends the values of the sensors. And this is then uh, really, really raw, in a very raw way, stored in a uh, very close to the machine. So this is often a proprietary file storage or something like this, because it's just about having a first place to put the data. So the values are sent continuously, could be different dif uh, intervals, like 100,000 or even more, uh, more things per second, but could also be only once in a minute or once every 10 minutes. Depends on the, on the use case. So if you want to, to, to measure the swinging of the wings of an airplane, you need a really, really high resolution. But if you want to see how high the level uh, of, of water is in a lake, this will be very low. So uh, a, usual, um, uh, a usual pass would look something like sensor, machine, assembly line, plant. So that's, that's basically the taxonomy on how the data could be structured. Examples for this implementation of those buses are SSI and Modbus. Then the data wants to learn to walk. And uh, here, already the first steps in computation are starting. So we have a, a buzzword that was uh, already quite strong some time ago, it's called edge computing. We see that appear again and again. So data is collected, and on the edge, which, which means in the machine, already the first filtering uh, happens. Could be enriched, could, uh, could be that values are combined, could be already a first kind of processing. So that people or the machines themselves can take immediate actions. For example, I don't know, it gets, the thing gets too hot, plastic or whatever gets too hot. Uh, this wouldn't work anymore to produce any uh, what, uh, yogurt cups or whatever. Uh, and so it needs to stop the machine. Then this information is packed into a transportation protocol. Sometimes this is uh, vendor-specific, highly depending on the machine. A lot of our customers say the people who produce the machine, they are not there yet, that they want to, uh, to ha that they can deal with all the sensors and that they uh, know how to, to process the data. So this is a process that is going on. Some of them are changing earlier. Some of them are still like the people who bend the metal to create whatever is necessary. There is uh, MQTT, MQP. Those are examples of transportation protocols that we see uh, widely used in the industry. How does this look? It's a very, very basic example. So the machine uh, just packs up uh, a message, could be a sensor value or whatever. Here uh, I made something for the uh, via developer thingy, and then something like Mosquito sends those data over the, over the internet. And then at one point it appears and it can be dealt further. So it's just about transportation. Uh, what also is important to mention, we are sending here uh, millions of data points every second, every minute. So it's not really, really important to everyone that all the data is transported. Next step, leaving home. Gather experience, it's called Yauth. So data is moving to central storage via the protocol we've just seen. It's collected there, and, but it's still almost everything. So it's still the raw data because People want to have it at the central place, and they want to, to maybe to have at one point everything. So we're talking to customers who say, for example, we produce tires. And if a tire blows up, maybe in two or three years, uh, they want to have the data because they would have different kinds of analytics in three years, but they still want to have the raw data to, to look at the production process and see if it was a problem in production or it was just a simple nail. So that's something why, uh, that's a reason why people store basically everything. And then on the technical side, we see broker and queues. 
So messages are get, getting broke. We see some examples afterwards. And then we see queues like uh, Kafka, uh, who are able to handle the first amount of in-streaming da data. So one of the messages bro uh, message brokers is AMQ, for example. It works with MQTT. I think it was written in Erlang. And uh, the whole MQTT thing uh, is based on topics. So you, you can see a couple of topics here. They could have uh, wildcards. Uh, they could just be like a very specific one. And then you have routes where you want to put the data. So we have uh, some endpoints here. And here, the first uh, splitting uh, takes place. And then we have subscribers. So we have different clients, and the broker uh, can uh, subscribe to them. So next step, data is becoming adult. It's getting its final shape. So there is a lot of stuff happening. It's normalization, transformation, enrichment, teaming up with other data that's coming from a, a different place. And then it gets indexed in some data store. And data is, become, uh, is starting to become uh, effective. One of the technologies uh, widely used is Apache Spark. It has the benefit that you can also uh, scale it horizontally. And um, yeah. That's something that we, we see very often. Another example is Node-RED. And this is really nice for prototyping or doing a first proof of concept. So we have here, like, uh, data is coming out, uh, in from on the one end. And at the end, it's stored in some kind of database. So uh, and then we do, yeah, we, we can do, uh, we can, um, oh no, yeah. So uh, there's some pre-processing happening. It's normalized. And yeah, another tool that you already heard before is Jupyter. That's also something we, we mostly use for prototyping. So um, we are doing here a cosinus phi uh, calculation. As I learned, uh, this is really important for people who provide power to us because they then know how the whole electricity net works. So we're do, doing a calculation there uh, based on in-streaming data and then inserting in it into uh, whatever database. And this is basically generating uh, from a sinus wave uh, a cosinus phi. Oh, you can hardly see it here. Um, calculation. Marriage. Data, when it gets out in the wild, it's grown up, it's old enough, it meets other data. And at some point, they say, hey, we like each other, so let's mar marry. What's all very often the use case is that this is a very specific subset. So you generate this huge amount of data, but um, you don't want to like pair everything. So people come here and they say it's a time, uh, time window. That's something that really often happens for reporting. So you want to know uh, how many users you had in, on this day, or uh, when there was an incident, for example, uh, you want to do a proper analysis, uh, for example, with R Studio uh, over a smaller time window. So you load the data for of one or two hours into R Studio do some processing on it, and put the uh, enriched uh, part back in. You could also do some machine learning. Things uh, we see very often are uh, Spark, machine learning lib, Jupyter, and R Studio. I was really surprised, because the last time I saw R was in a, at the university in 2007, I think. And then I didn't see it for like years, and now uh, a lot of uh, companies or customers we're talking to, they say, yeah, we're doing this with R, and we don't really want to change it. And as I, I just learned, uh, Microsoft now also want to in integrate R into their uh, SQL server as a basic language where you can write stored procedures or something like this. So this might be also really interesting. 
Okay, so we have here our uh, node red assembly where the data uh, is also coming in from the left. We heard uh, something in the talk before about the text processing. Uh, this whole setup is also uh, something that does uh, text processing. So we're doing sentiment analysis of GitHub data. It's also something we just heard before. So we're taking the data from GitHub archive, putting it into this line, and then we use IBM Watson to do uh, analysis, an, uh, analysis of it. And then it returns, you will see that, uh, so this is the request. We are just uh, yeah, pushing a message in the payload there. And so that's really nice in Node-RED because you can uh, write uh, code in JavaScript and enrich those uh, nodes you see in this visualization. And um, what is returned is basically emotions. So we, we provide uh, issue comments or issue text or um, commit messages to IBM Watson. And it returns to us and say, I'm 80% sure this was a sad commit, or I'm 80% sure this is a happy commit. And then we can do things with it. So we have the data, the GitHub data. It's really a huge data set. I think it's uh, uh, almost uh, a billion uh, commit messages. And um, we take this, give it to Watson, and combine it then with the enriched, uh, enriched data set. So almost every one of us knows a grown a grown up life, a grown up's life, uh, going to work. So this means high volume, high volume of data for the data. Uh, you want real time access. You need to be responsive to everyone very fast, and you also need to feed stuff. And in this case, data is fed to applications. So where does this live? It's uh, one example is Amazon Redis. Apache Cassandra, Google Spanner is something that came up recently, and also CreateDB. And uh, yeah, so here is, for example, a, a screenshot of the CreateDB admin UI, and that's also the GitHub data. So um, yeah, here is a one important thing that you want to do with your data. You want to partition and uh, you want to shard it, because the, those um, Databases I just mentioned, uh, they run distributed, and for proper distributed uh, computing in databases, you need uh, proper, uh, proper sharding. And in some cases, it also makes sense to partition data. So here, for example, we have a monthly partition, which means this makes queries in one month, uh, that you do to one month very, very fast. And so if you look, uh, you don't have to look at the whole data set, for example, if you do aggregations or, or whatsoever. You look at a, a smaller subset, you can see this at your, uh, as its own table, and uh, this makes it very fast. And so, for example, if we take our enriched GitHub uh, table, where we have those emotions of sadness, uh, disgust, joy, anger, and fear, and then you can do a query on it. And we are querying here uh, those uh, 950 millions, and doing an aggregation on it with a conditional function, and it takes like uh, one, uh, 0 0.4 seconds to return the averages for those um, uh, those fields. And then, at one point, you have your data there, and it's grown up, and you know it has the it has the right shape, and then you want to harvest the stuff getting value out of data. And this could be done by visualization. By machine learning, machine learning uh, for doing things like pattern recognition, uh, recognition anomaly detection, that things you need uh, to do for predictive maintenance to keep your machines run, uh, running. And then you can also do alerting, say, hey, I'm running out of paper, I'm running out of water, uh, that's something that's very easy to do, but uh, those are highly complex things that go on uh, when you, for example, melt plastic or something to create a bottle out of it. And then you can take actions. So that's the thing that people want to do. 
Examples for those are Grafana, Metabase, uh, that's the visualization part. Prometheus is something that uh, we also hear uh, a lot recently. And what we saw, uh, we've also seen is TensorFlow uh, machine learning framework. So you go to your visualization tool, and you have the database behind where you can real time, uh, where you can do real time queries on large data sets. And then you just uh, put in the table and say what kind of analysis you want to do. And here we are back to our cosinus phi data again. And then you can have of a, a, a nice visualization where you can see where you have problems. So for example, in this case, this is the cosinus phi of a, of a house where, where all uh, the tools inside the house were, were measured. Uh, and uh, you can see, OK, there was something before uh, 6 o'clock, 9 minutes. Because the cosinus phi should, should look uh, uh, more, more like balanced. Yeah, and then at one point, data may even be retired. And this means it's moved to some colder storage. Things where you want to do real time analytics, that's really, really hot. And most of the time, it's also very expensive because you need, uh, you need uh, different machines. And so there are things like Amazon S3 or Amazon Glacier or also some local storage you have in your data center. And you put the data here. It's very common that you have like a moving window, especially with those sensor data. They always have a timestamp. And you say, OK, I want to do proper analytics of the last week, but before it's, uh, I just need this enriched or reduced uh, version of the data so I can put the, the older one uh, somewhere else. So one example that you can do is creating a snapshot and you move it to S3. So if you would do uh, on a GitHub data, do a snapshot uh, on a partition, makes sense. Uh, then you can move all the data to S3 whenever it is done you just de uh, delete the, the whole partition. So when will data die? Interestingly, it mostly dies at a really early stage because you filter out stuff. And at, uh, at one point, when you have like proper data, Sorry, I was just confused because the screen changed, and, uh, but it just says, uh, tells me that I have five minutes left. So uh, data dies when it's filtered. But at one point, when you say, this is the data set I want, and it's properly, then you just put it to Amazon Glacier, Amazon S3, whatever, and, and store it there. So that at one point, when you have your customer who says, hey, uh, I had the problem with my tire, my car flipped. Uh, I want to know if this was a problem of the production. Then you can go back to this cold storage, say, I want this window, I want to have a look at it, so please give it to me, and then you do the analytics again. So it is value that you don't want to give away, and it could also be an insurance. So the conclusion. Data changes its shape over time. Something very important, we've seen that, a lot of transformation going on, a lot of tools working with, with data. It's really a long journey till it's used. So it goes through a lot of application, goes through a, a lot of wires, until at one point it really uh, uh, make, uh, made use of it. And what we also think is that the standard is just about to be established. So for some things, there are already tools where you know, okay, if I want to do have like a production setup, I use this and that. And that's something that's really obvious. But in other areas, uh, it's still not that clear. So there are a lot of things, uh, new things coming, a lot of other things going away. And that's something that hopefully will evolve over the next, uh, uh, over the next couple of years. Thanks a lot. This was my presentation. If you have any questions, ask them now afterwards or write me an email. Thank you, Johannes. Great talk.